Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for GMs. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today, we're diving into the latest D&D 1 playtest packet that dropped at the end of September 2022, which covers the so-called expert classes, the Bard, the Ranger, and the Rogue. Now, this is a pretty beefy packet here. There's a lot to unpack. Uh, so we are actually going to break this into two videos. Today, we're going to look at the expert classes and the changes that have been made to them and how those differ from what is in 5th edition D&D. In a separate video, we're going to look at the feats and rules mechanics and just talk a little bit more about those in depth. One D&D is not coming out until 2024, so we have a good while to take a look at what is being offered here and give feedback. And one thing that I can say right away is it is apparent in this document that the feedback does matter. And that's something that I think is very important, is that when you are looking at these rules, I do get the impression that the people at Wizards of the Coast are throwing a lot of stuff out there and seeing what sticks, what doesn't, what's going to work, what won't work, and they're just trying things. So we really have an opportunity here to help shape the future of D&D with our input. So keep that in mind as we go forward that some of the things that we're unhappy about, some of the things that we are happy about, make sure that if you share our opinions on that or have your own opinions, to share that with Wizards of the Coast so that we can help shape what's to come. At the same time, I do want to echo a sentiment that was recently put out by Chris over at Treant Monk's Temple. He's a good friend of ours, and he released an open letter to Jeremy Crawford and the design team asking for a little bit more of an inside look at the design intent behind these changes. I think that there's a lot to digest here, and without a little bit more from the designers and a little bit more communication going into the why some of these changes were made, it's hard to contextualize exactly what's going on in these documents. So we just want to echo the comments of, of Chris and others who have asked for a little bit more transparency and a little bit more openness from the D&D One design team about why they've made the changes that they made so that we can offer better feedback ourselves. There's a lot to discuss, so let's get rolling. So the first big thing is the categorizations. The design team has told us that there are four main categories of classes in, in the next iteration of D&D. The experts, the mages, the priests, and the warriors. And they very neatly sorted all 12 of the core classes from 5th edition, kind of also including the artificer in the mix here, into their neat little boxes. Despite the fact that I personally feel that you could put the monk in about three of the four different categories and you could probably put the paladin in a bunch of different of these categories. You could probably put the ranger in a bunch of different ones. So it feels a little arbitrary, but maybe it's a useful conceit in the design process. That I think was my only opinion about this is that the, the monk, I always see as a religious character. They are in tune with body and mind, often training at a temple. There's a lot of religion behind the fantasy of monks. I wonder if that's a real world thing because we have the monk association in both um, European and Eastern sort of religious contexts as well. And then their association with martial, martial artists is more of a D&D-ism or more of a game-ism than anything else. So I do think that it's it's a little bit of which box does this fit into. Yeah, and I feel the same for the paladin. The paladin could be a warrior more so than a priest. And calling a paladin a priest is interesting. I get it. Like, less of a complaint there. But it is just interesting that it's hard to put some of these classes in boxes. Yeah, and I mean, this is not the first time that the D&D team has done this. And not the first time that we've seen this kind of idea in a role-playing game. Fourth edition D&D, after all, had the defender, the striker, the controller, and the leader categories for the classes. And that categorization carried a lot of mechanical and design assumptions with it. And some people felt it really pigeonholed those classes because it was about a party role thing. Whereas the categorizations here feel more thematic, although the experts seem to also be characterized by the idea that they all get the expertise class feature. But then are we going to see class feature consistencies amongst the priests? Like, are they going to give channel divinity in some way to the druid 
because that's kind of the odd one out in that category. Yeah, and I'm interested to see what they do with that. At the same time, I think you're onto something with the fact that this isn't really breaking the game, and it's not saying monks can't be religious characters. What they're using this for is to determine sort of a template that they can apply to a group of classes. And that is actually something that I do like here is the subclass features. And mm. in the expert classes that we see in this document, we see the same features given at the same levels for all of the classes in this category. True, but let's be real. The actual mechanical difference between the classes in D&D 5th edition, at least, is are you a full caster, a half caster, a not caster, or a warlock? Like, really, really and truly, that those are the four class templates that are... Um, and I would say those are more impactful in terms of the design philosophy for the characters than anything. So I, I do wonder if, if, if maybe there's a lot of like different mechanical parallels. So it's a little arbitrary. It's fine. I mean, go with it. It's all right. <laughs> um, as well as general changes that we have, as I mentioned, the subclass features for the expert classes come online at 3rd, 6th, 10th, and 14th level, mm -hmm. which I just find that that's easier for everybody if it's all the same. Yeah, I mean, it's going to require a little bit of adjustment for um, making subclasses that are not made for the new iteration of the player's handbook backwards compatible but they've even said in this document just ignore it and just make those class features come online at the levels that they say they say they do so if you're using older versions of the subclasses that's supposed to be that thing and and that is one of the things that actually did surprise me most about this document is the backwards compatibility because i do think aside from that weird subclass mismatch thing you could play the new D D one classes as presented here in a party with any of the old versions and you not even notice right this document it relies on you using the old versions of the spells and filling in the gaps of all the old rules so it isn't it is inherently backwards compatible because it's just really that iteration so overall to me my impression of this is yeah the backwards compatibility is very evident uh it's very there are there going to be minor tweaks that you'll have to make to massage things across? Yeah, yes, but that was the case, of course, with 3.5 and 3rd edition, and that was the case with the 4th edition D&D Essentials uh, line, and any sort of tweaks that have happened with, with other games. Like, I mean, we could go across the tweaks that have existed to the various versions of Call of Cthulhu, which is very small changes. All of that to say, based on this packet, I don't think that you would have a problem using a subclass that was printed in Tasha's or Xanathar's or a third-party source that wasn't updated to D&D &D 1 with all the other D&D &D 1 stuff. What I actually love about this document is that a lot of the changes that are being made are things that not only you and I have talked about, but that we've seen from the community as a whole constantly say, man, I wish these certain rules were buffed in this way or changed in this way, or this is too powerful, or this isn't powerful enough. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot in this document that actually feels like they've been listening to the community. This play this document definitely shows us a few slain bugbears, especially when we get into the ranger. I think that the li listening to the community is very evident in the changes that have been asked for and the iteration of, the, of that design. At the same time, there's a few other monsters that are rearing their ugly heads here. And there's one in particular that I want to call out on that is both a wonderful change shackled to a massive step backwards. In this playtest document, the Bard and the Ranger are presented as prepared spellcasters, as opposed to being casters that have to choose their spells known. This means that you have access as a Bard or a Ranger to the entire spell list, and every day, like a wizard or a cleric, you choose which spells you're going to prepare, which is a massive upgrade in terms of the flexibility and ease of use of these classes as spellcasters. You are no longer beholden to the choice that you made when leveling up your character, and I think that this is a hugely positive change. I, I agree. I think that all casters should be prepared casters. It's the best way to go. It's user friendly for like new players, yes. even experienced players. Really, I don't pick a lot of spells because I'm afraid that I'm going to regret that decision. Mm -hmm. If I've never tried a spell out at the table, it's hard for me to be like, oh, 
I wonder if I want to take Knock, which I think is a great spell, but it's hard to choose it. But now that I can pick it for a certain mission, drop it and pick something different, just all spells being available to you is such a great change. However, this is also tied to another change that we are not as big of fans of, and that is that when you are choosing your spells, you have to choose a number of spells equal to your spell slots available. So if you have four first level spell slots and two second level spell slots, you have to pick four first level spells and two second level spells. This becomes more of a problem for me when we get into higher level play where you only have one six level spell slot and you have to pick only one six level spells. There's a lot of times that I like having a choice on which spell I'm going to cast and when the moment presents itself, I get to know whether I want to cast uh, a damage dealing spell or a control spell given the moment in play. But now, even though I have the flexibility of choosing from my whole spell list, I have to pick which spells I'm packing for that day and don't have the flexibility to pack more than one six level spell or leave spots and gaps open to to broaden my higher level spells, even second and third, while saying all my first level spell slots are going to be used for shield. Even as my sorcerer Sebastian, my only first level spell is shield, <laughs> where I usually yeah. have more on yeah. the upper end because I want those choices available for me. This change brings the spell casting and spell preparation mechanics into this weird hybrid space that is similar to the ways that spellcasting and preparation worked in prior editions of D&D, particularly 3.5 and earlier, where instead of even having the flexibility to choose what spells you prepared, and then, you know, in, in our aforementioned example, you could prepare shield, magic missile, um, tensor's floating disc, and um, fog cloud, but you could still end up casting shield four times with your slots. Whereas in 3rd edition and prior editions, if you wanted to cast shield four times, you had to prepare shield four times. You had to prepare the actual spell multiple times. I played a lot of 3rd edition, a bit of 2nd edition, a lot of 3.5. I have spreadsheets still made out of all my spell preparations for all those old characters. And that is something that I do not miss. Um, that kind of spreadsheet approach of having to plan out all your spells and all your spell slots in advance was a ton of bookkeeping. And while this isn't quite as bad as what it was in 3rd edition and 3.5, I really, really liked just being told, prepare a number of spells equal to your class level plus your ability score modifier. Boom, you're done. Use them as you see fit. That's really easy. It's really elegant. There's no sort of finagling or bookkeeping at all required. And it's one of my favorite elements of the way that playing a wizard or a cleric works in D&D 5e. And I think that that is something that I would rather just see as the standard across all classes rather than this, you know, what is your X level spell prepared? Give us the full flexibility. That's, that's what we want. So those are some of the broad changes that are happening to the classes. Now let's actually talk about the three classes presented in this document, the Bard, the Ranger, and the Rogue. We'll start with the Bard. We already mentioned the prepared spell casting, which I think is great on a Bard. I love the idea of mm. just being able to pick whatever Bard spells I want. Bards have a great arsenal of utility spells, buff spells, control spells, illusions and kind of getting to pick yeah. and choose what you're going to specialize in. Yeah, and I, I really do think that the bards being a prepared caster makes a lot of sense because you learn new songs all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so you're always adding to your repertoire. So that's been one of those things that have always that's always felt odd to me about a bard not being able to pick up new spells or change things out or, you know, change up their set list. I don't know. Um, and, you know, I'd like to see more leaning into that flavor, perhaps. Um, I think that the biggest thing to discuss with the Bard, because the, most of it's pretty the same, is Bardic Inspiration. Yes, Bardic Inspiration has changed. Uh, some might say for the better, some might say for the worse. Um, 
I think that there's a pro and con here, but overall, I actually like what's happening with Bardic Inspiration. Bardic Inspiration has now changed to a reaction that you use when a D20 test is failed. I love that because my biggest issue with Bardic Inspiration, when I have been a bard, I sometimes forget to use Bardic Inspiration. When I have been a player who has received Bardic Inspiration, I often forget to use it as that player. So on both sides of the table, you have an element of forgetfulness that, oh right, I could have added a D6 to that mm -hmm. role. Um, now having it be a reaction, not only does it free up your bonus action as a bard, which can be used for so many other things, but it also means that it is always a useful play. Nobody's forgetting to use the Bardic Inspiration. It's less wasteful of those Bardic Inspiration die. Yes. How many times has a character had Bardic Inspiration and then not needed to use it or forgotten to use it in the span of time that they had it? You might ace all your attack rolls while you're holding on to that Bardic Inspiration die. You might succeed on your checks or just over succeed in a huge degree. And so there are were times where a Bardic Inspiration die would often be wasted. And so I think that this change does counterbalance the fact that you get less uses of Bardic Inspiration. I wonder if the middle ground here is to take a page out of the Eloquence Bard, which is already the most powerful Bard subclass. If you use Bardic Inspiration and the check result still fails, that Bardic Inspiration is not expended in that case. Um, that might be a nice way to just smooth out the whole interaction, and I, I think that that's a nice way. You, you're always getting something for your for your attempt. Either that, or I, I just really think it's probably fine if Bardic Inspirations do come back on a short rest, and that doesn't need to be something that we wait for seven levels to get. I, I do agree. With, I think I agree more with the second one, but that might also be because the complication then becomes with your first option that we now need a new cool ability for the Eloquence Bard that makes them special. I um, have enough that makes them special. I know, but I want them to be the most special Okay. because they're so eloquent. But I do agree that um, with the changes that we're seeing, Bardic Inspiration being more readily useful is kind of the theme, mm -hmm. and I think we could go even further with it. I also like the Songs of Restoration feature, giving the Bard their healing spells, and I do wonder if in the future we might see this as one of those choices that you can make with your character, where maybe your Bard doesn't have the Songs of Restoration and gets to choose a different spell list, or maybe even the Bard subclasses, because giving you extra spells that are added to your spell list in that sort of specialized way. In this playtest document, bards don't get access to spells from the school of Abjuration, Evocation, Necromancy, and Conjuration. And while I do understand that blanket restriction, I, I really do like the more thematic way of having a unique spell list that isn't restricted by school, and that way we can have the rare Evocation spell or the rare Abjuration spell that is thematically appropriate within the class. The only other big change, I think, with the Bard is actually with the subclass that they present, the Lore Bard. When I look at the changes to the Lore Bard, I'm actually pretty disappointed here, because when I say Lore Bard, which class feature do you think of first? Uh, getting Magical Secrets at level 6. Yes, and, and guess what they removed? Getting Magical Secrets at level 6. The Lore Bard, to yeah. me, was the Bard that got extra Magical Secrets, and it actually was not only the coolest ability that they got and the first one I think of, it also was very thematic. This was a great case of the powerful ability echoing the mm -hmm. theme of the subclass. Lore bards are the most intelligent and most studied of the bards, therefore they have spells that are beyond the scope of most bards. Removing that just seems like an odd choice to I mean, me. you're still going to get the high-level magical secrets, but I like that. I like getting it early. Yeah. Um, it was fun. Um, overall, I'm, you know, I don't love the changes to the lore bard. I would have been happy if there were simply no changes to the subclass. It would have just been fine, fine for me in, in this new playtest. And so I might playtest it with the old rules and see how the new base class works with the new rules. I think that would work. As we move on to the Ranger, though, this is one that I feel just got an epic glow up. I agree. We've already seen 
through 5th edition's career, the Ranger go from one of the least liked classes in the game to something that actually mm. presents a really playable option. And now this feels like the final statement to say Rangers are awesome. Yeah, I think straight off, off the bat, giving Rangers expertise instead of all of their natural explorer other class features kind of solves the problem of the ranger having a class feature that just automatically negates wilderness exploration instead of them just being really good with the exploration skills um and so now they can have really good nature really good survival or if you just want to be a really good stealth and acrobatics type character i think that's totally fine there as well. So I, I call that uh, definitely a pretty good trade. Yes, I yeah. think expertise is a great ability and it feels very appropriate on the Rangers. The other thing though that I absolutely love is that we get cantrips now as a Ranger. Yeah, you get access to the whole primal spell list Start and you get spell casting right away at level one. The only thing you can't choose from the primal spell list are no evocation spells, which Sad, you can't nab fairy fire because it's <laughs> evocation. That was like the first thing when I saw fairy fire on the on the spell primal spell list, and I'm like, Rangers get that. And then I realized it was evocation because that would have been super good. <laughs> but still, I think spell casting at first level and having cantrips yeah. is just such a a raise in the bar of the ranger being a half caster. Yeah, they are still going to remain great in combat. That's something that Rangers, and now with expertise, yeah. their great skills, great combat, and we improve their spell casting. Really happy with that. Yeah, like the other kind of side benefit, and we're going to talk about this more with the, the dual wielding change, though, is the changes to the Hunter's Mark as well. Yes. Where they can now know Hunter's Mark automatically, cast it without having to concentrate on it. And what that means is combined with the changes to dual wielding, you now don't need to use your bonus action to dual wield weapons. And so I think that a ranger and the dual wielding fighting style are actually gonna be, based on this, it's pretty strong. It's it's a very strong damage dealer based on everything that's, that's here within this and one of the stronger ones perhaps for melee combat at least. I think that this, this was one of my favorite things to see in this document because every time I've ever built a ranger, yeah. I'm mumbling under my breath, man, I wish Hunter's Mark was just a class feature. Yep. And it is now. You get it. You don't need to concentrate on it. It's just baked into the class. Like, you have Hunter's Mark. Here, use it. The fact that you don't have to concentrate on it, and as you said, the changes to dual wielding, be, being able to drop Hunter's Mark, run into combat, not worry about losing your concentration on it, and dealing extra damage, that is so cool for a ranger. I, I love it. I'm obsessed. Yeah. I want to play a ranger so bad. And then between rounds, when you don't need to move your Hunter's Mark around, you can cast Healing Word now. <laughs> Yeah. Rangers with Healing Word is pretty interesting. And um, just the the added kind of... I, I wonder what other primal spells will turn out to be, oh, Rangers get that now? That's really cool. On top of that, Rangers have the Rover ability that gives them a climb speed and a swim speed, which feels great. They're natural mm -hmm. in the natural environments. Uh, on top of that, the uh, the Nature's Veil ability, I think, is really awesome. Uh, bonus action to become invisible. And I, I imagine role-playing that in so many ways, like using the, the shrubs and trees to hide. But, like, it's almost like you're a predator. But you turn invisible as a bonus action until the end of your next turn, which means that you could bonus action turn yourself invisible to get advantage on your attacks for basically two turns. Yeah, yeah. I, I I now want to play a ranger yeah. based on the predator. And you've also got blind sight. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, actually the combination, climb speed, swim speed, turning yourself invisible, fighting with two weapons, choosing your, your prey, gaining blind sight. Um, and then eventually the Foe Slayer feature upgrades Hunter's Mark to a D10. I I think we got the Predator Ranger here. I yeah. I think the Ranger has moved its way into possibly... I, I need to play this new yeah. Ranger. But I'm feeling like it's in my top three to four classes in the game now. It's really had a big spike in power. And I think that the... Again, we'll discuss this in the ne next episode, but the changes to Sharpshooter and Great Weapon Master definitely level the playing field in a big way when it comes to damage dealers. And so I think the Ranger now has all the tools that it needs to kind of be 
perhaps on par with paladins which is a pretty big change over in in the yeah yeah i mean we'll see what they do for the paladin but assuming the paladin gets kind of the light touch that the bard got um then yeah it really is a big escalation yeah as a final note the hunter subclass is in here and they've actually removed the customization the choices which yeah. we did complain in our subclass video that the hunter's choices some were better than others but rather than remove them, I wish we had seen a leveling of them. I'm just going to be honest. It feels like the Hunter just doesn't have any sort of clear archetype to it, thematically speaking. Like, if we look at how the changes have gone for the Ranger over the course of its subclass design, where we see things now like the Fey Wanderer and the Beastmaster and the Drake Warden and getting things like the um, Gloomstalker, I really just think that when it comes to Ranger subclasses, there should be i'm gonna say this till, till till the end it should just be what is your animal companion is it a drake warden is it a pack master with wolves is it a bear master like i think that that would be the clear way of going forward with ranger subclass design um and then of course having a i i think a subclass that was like the lone wolf subclass that didn't get an animal companion. And then then you could then find some sort of thematic design, but like the hunter is still like double down on ranger. And I guess maybe we still need to double down because the lore bard is kind of doubling down on being a, a bard and the thief rogue is doubling down. But I don't know, it just feels like the hunter ranger just doesn't have like the story there. Yeah. Yeah. And they've removed the elements of it that made it stand out. And I just feel like that's a yeah. strange choice. Yeah, I, I do see the, that, you know, it, it, it is interesting because one of the things that D&D &D 5e hasn't done that could have been an alternate reality take, um, and I've seen many people suggest this over the years, is that instead of choosing a subclass which locks you in for abilities, that whenever the subclass feature comes in, then you've got a choice of different attributes, right? D&D &D 5e went the more route of like, here is, here's what you get instead of here's a wide wide range of options that you can kind of choose from a smorgasbord menu. So whenever we see a smorgasbord menu subclass, it feels a little weird. It is it is tough because I love subclasses that let you pick. I do too. Um, it's just that that's not the design that 5th edition has gone with overall. And so yeah. when we do get the choice-based subclasses, Oftentimes, they're the ones where there's one really strong choice or all the choices are bad, right? So, like, if, if you look at some of the other subclasses where you are given those options, like, for example, the Bear Totem Barbarian, um, <laughs> there you go, right? Yeah. Um, even though sometimes it, it, can, it can be open-ended. Yeah, you know, it, it does make you posit what would the alternate reality be like if, if that was the design philosophy for 5th for edition. Um, but... It's just not the the direction that the designers are going with the game. Obvi it's obviously not, and yeah. I think and I think that if you're hoping for that, um, the good news is there's a lot of other RPGs that do do that. Yeah. <laughs> um. So uh, try those out instead. <laughs> now, as we move to the rogue, I think this one has the least amount of changes. Uh, the rogue, by and large, is pretty much the same as it's always been. Yeah. There are a few notable things uh, to talk about, though. The first one is one that I don't think needs to happen, and that's a small change to sneak attack. Sneak attack now has to happen on your turn. And although that may not seem like a big change, the fact that I, as a rogue player, cannot set up an ambush ready in action for when the monsters turn that corner, I'm going to snipe one of them, because now as readying an action, the action no longer happens on my turn. Mm. I cannot get sneak attack. That feels silly. Like rogues, I, I've never seen a rogue player who didn't try to set up an ambush. Exactly. And the fact that, the, that that's kind of like the womp womp behind this change, right? I think that rogue players ready actions all the time so that they can get a more opportune sneak attack in and it's not just opportunity attacks. Like, I, I do think that, yes, there is this whole thing about how you can engineer a rogue to be able to sneak attack multiple times per round. And if, if that was the concern, just say once per round. 
yeah. instead of once per and once on your turn. Um, if it was once per round, if that's the balancing factor. But overall, I mean, we we're talking about this uh, in our Discord with some of our patrons, where in the grand scheme of things, at least it, in the current state of 5th edition, Rogue's damage is not that great compared to what other classes can achieve because of what access they have to. And it might be different now with the shift in the meta with D&D 1, but... You know, even even rogues that are able to consistently land that sneak attack um, on their reaction and on their turn still were really fighting to keep up with some of the bigger damage dealers. If I go a turn and don't land sneak attack, I am a pathetic character on the battlefield. <laughs> when I do land sneak attack, I am almost close to what Jill puts out. Yeah, yeah. Now, the balancing in the feats and all of that could impact this and bring it all to a level playing field, but mm -hmm. I just think Rogue's got a sneak attack. Let them sneak attack. Yeah. Uh, really, the only other big changes here are I do actually love the change to the 13th level feature. My Rogue just gained 13th level not using the 1 D&D &D rules, yeah. and the 13th level feature is okay it allows you to use your bonus action to gain advantage on an acrobatics or athletics check mm -hmm. now with subtle strikes the 13th level feature essentially gives the rogue pack tactics as long as there's an ally within five feet of the enemy you're targeting you have advantage on that attack rather than trading my bonus action for an acrobatic feat um i think being able to reliably hit your sneak attacks yeah. when you have an ally, because that's the whole point of a rogue. Your ally's tangled up with the enemy. You get to hit them in their sweet spot. Yeah, and getting that advantage gives a huge amount of reliability to the rogues, although, and I guess that's supposed to be their higher level damage upgrade, but I do think that rogues get advantage a lot. There's a lot of ways to do it, even with things like the, the cunning action aim is a, is a feature there in there as well. So I do wonder if we need to iterate a little bit more and think about what the rogue's higher level damage boost is. Um, maybe it's something as simple as at 13th level, your sneak attack dice become D8s. Um, I, I like rolling a fistful of D6s, so I don't know, but it definitely needs to be a feature that you have to commit to the rogue class that you can't pilfer with multi-classing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do think the only other thing that made me a little sad, but at the same time it's not a big deal, is they moved Evasion. Evasion was a 7th level feature, but now it's been pushed to 9th level. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I do feel like getting it at 7th level already felt like I was dying to get it. And it was late enough that you couldn't just dip in Rogue to get Evasion. Yeah. So pushing it to 9th level seems unnecessary, but... It's not the end of the world. I'm not like super upset. It's just when I saw that, I went, oh, I liked evasion where it was. Overall, looking at these three classes, I'm quite positive overall. These are iterative small changes that are definitely showing that they will be backwards compatible with the existing materials released for fifth edition. I can see how if you were expecting a massive overhaul and redesign that represented a paradigm shift, this might be a very disappointing document for you. <laughs> Yeah, but at yeah. the same time, I think the bigger question that people had is when they say backwards compatibility, are they serious? And looking at this document, I think that you could tack all of this onto 5th mm -hmm. edition without much of a headache. I do think that, again, we need to use our feedback tools to let yeah. Wizards of the Coast know what they nailed and what they didn't. There's a lot of changes here that I think are for the better for 5th edition. There's a few that... I am wondering why the heck they decided to do this. Yeah, I think that there is a lot of leeway though in redesigning the classes and making changes to the classes and maintaining backwards compatibility overall. One of the things that surprised me about this overall document was that they standardized when classes get their subclass features, which does actually impact backwards compatibility, but not in a massive way, in a way that they acknowledge, you know, you just ignore it and go with the old progression which might feel a little bit bolted on so we'll see if that is a change that stands and of course maybe people will ask maybe the feedback response will be we wanted more changes than this um, in which case we could even get a more drastic overhaul in the future so it's anyone's game at this point like if, if this will remain 
what I would consider on the whole a conservative set of iterative changes, at least as far as the classes are concerned. There's a couple other things in the rules glossary that are pretty big shifts. Um, I would even go as far as saying that are pretty big nerfs, um, which we'll talk about in the next episode when we look at those specifically. So if you have any comments on the new expert classes and the overall class feature changes, let us know in the comments below. And stay tuned because our next video is going to be looking at the rest of this rather large playtest document for 1D&D. The videos on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity from our Patreon supporters and we had a lot of fun discussing this playtest packet on our patron-only Discord server. If you enjoy the work that we do here on YouTube and want to become a patron of our show, follow the links in the description below. And if you want to see us playing D&D, you can check out our live play in the Worlds of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday evenings on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we've got a new playlist compiling all of our thoughts on the playtest for D&D 1 right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.